I, you know, I would encourage architects who are listening to this to, to think about this similarly. It's not just about making a beautiful building or a beautiful space, but can you really solve the business problem? Can you really help somebody look at, at their space differently and help them change how they do business through your services of architecture? So it's, you know, the consulting piece of it, I think is so much greater than, than just the design of, of the building or the physical space. Episode 138. This is the business of architecture. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is the show where you'll discover tips, strategies, and secrets for running a profitable and impactful architecture practice. If you believe that it's possible to make money and do good, then this is the show for you. If you aren't already on the Business of Architecture email list, make sure you claim your free account on businessofarchitecture.com by clicking the green Join Today button. I'm your host, Enix Sears. Today's show is sponsored by BQE Software, the makers of ArchiOffice. ArchiOffice is the office and project management software built with the needs of architects in mind. And for a limited time, startup firms can get two free seats of ArchiOffice for a year. Go check it out at ArchiOffice.com. Today is the second part of my interview with writer, speaker, and author Josh Miles of the visual identity and branding firm Miles Herndon. You can pick up a free chapter from his book, Bold Brand, at milesdesign.com. Awesome. Well, Josh, obviously you're practicing what you preach. You guys are producing the content. You're doing the email marketing in a way that's that's friendly, that's personal, that's enjoyable to, to interact with. You also talked about the fact that you're, it sounds like you're toying around. You have the setup for a podcast. You have a podcast in the works. Tell us about your plan about kind of podcasting. Yeah, we're pretty excited about it. Um, uh, when we set up all this stuff, we said, you know what, in, starting in October, we're going to start recording. Well, that does, hasn't happened yet, <laughs> but I've at least uh, been fortunate enough to make some guest appearances on a few other shows. Um, the show is going to be called Obsessed with Design, and uh, we'll eventually be operating out of ObsessedShow.com and uh, Twitter, uh, at Obsessed Show on Twitter. Um, so keep an eye on those, maybe bookmark those come back and check it out here soon, but we're going to be interviewing designers of all stripes. So one week I want to interview a branding guy. The next week I want to interview an architect, maybe an industrial designer. Um, we've got a, a process designer lined up as well. So wait, 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 wait. You're going to interview potential competitors. Absolutely. It's uh, it's kind of a crazy thing, but, um, this is actually a long story, so I'll give you the short version of it. Well, no, let's let's we have time. I mean, if it adds to the conversation, Josh, sure. we'd love to hear it. You you be the judge okay. of how long sure. it's going to be. So, um, you're familiar with the uh, the Russell Crowe movie from a few years back called The Beautiful Mind, where he was uh, tracking love everything it. and love he it. had pins on his walls and dragging string across his garage and making connections between all these things. So, my friends often joked that yeah. I was that guy because. I kept this physical record of all the people that I knew and all of my contacts, all my clients, all of our employees and where they came from that I could track that these people came from this dot and this dot contributed to these other things. Um, and over time I came to realize that some of the groups that I hung out with networking groups and associations where my competitors were drove more business than anything else. So in particular for us, it was, it was AIGA, it was SMPS, it was a local networking organization. All of those groups where my other competitors were hanging out were the groups where I was getting the most fruitful and strongest connections. So we're going to test this, uh, this theory in the podcasting realm <laughs> and actually bring in some competitors to interview as well. Um, and at the same time, I think we'll have designers who, who touch a lot of things that, that we don't get into. So um, ultimately, uh, the way we operate here, uh, all of our designers are what I would categorize as a little obsessive compulsive, you know, where the, the kerning has to be just right and the colors have to be just perfect and the consistency matters and the details, you know, the details are where it's at, the thickness of the paper, the, the shininess of the ink, you know, these are all things that we are absolutely obsessed with. So. I want to find other folks who are equally as obsessed, uh, regardless of what kind of design it is. And I want to hear what makes them tick. 
and, and what uh, keeps them up at night and what really drives them to do excellent work. So I think unpacking their stories and their process could make for, uh, first of all, it's conversations that I'm really interested to have. And I think that's what will make for a great podcast. Very, very interesting. Um, I, I think we're, and I, of course that was tongue in cheek when I said, stop, you're interviewing competitors. But, um, and the reason why is just because I think initially with this new car, sort of content marketing, it is a brave new world. And it is easy to think that somehow we're giving up some of our own personal um, secret sauce, as you say, or, you know, shining light on competitors. But what I've personally found is that the more we give, it seems like the more comes yeah, back absolutely. to us. Absolutely. I think. The more that you put out there, um, you know, I've, I've heard the example before about, you know, the McDonald's uh, secret sauce and that every other burger chain in the country has a burger that looks almost the same that has Thousand Island dressing on it. So the secret is not really all that big of a secret. You know, the fact that you have a process and follow a process and it does these five steps that all start with D or whatever it is, you know, every other firm in the country probably does something really similarly. But the fact that you are out there talking about it and espousing why you think it's the right way to do it and about um, how your passion drives that, I think um, that puts you head and shoulders above your competitors. Well, Josh, keep keep me informed about when the podcast goes live. We're definitely going to want to share that with all of our listeners because I think that my audience is definitely going to want to tune into your show and make sure they're going to be frequent listeners. Sounds like it's going to be, you know, architects, we're interested in design. And if they're listening to this show, they're also interested in marketing and business development. So that I think that'll be a great fit. So definitely. Yeah, I would hope there's uh, quite a few of your listeners who will be interested in being guests. Absolutely. Well, hey, and tell me about about your firm, Miles Herndon. Uh, is this a recent merger? How long have you been with uh, yeah, so, Redwall? Yeah, um, so I started a company called Miles Design about 13 years ago. Uh, and earlier this year, in February of 2015, uh, I started talking to Daniel Herndon, who is the principal of a company called Redwall. They were about two blocks down the street from us in downtown Indianapolis. And I'd known Daniel for about six years, and uh, they started out a little bit more focused in the social media and marketing side of the fence. And we definitely started more on the design side, and we sort of met in the middle in the branding and website design space. So um, we decided to do this uh, and announced it publicly in June of this year. And uh, we went from about 10 people, respectively, each to 20 in total. Um, and the, the merged firm has had uh, already had some really good uh, momentum in the market, and we're working with uh, firms all around the country. Excellent. Thank Congratulations. You. you know, I think that designers, uh, advertising, branding firms, you know, probably have a lot of the same challenges architects do in terms of um, commoditization yeah. or, or fears about that. You know, obviously, uh, with this whole new change, one of the changes that's been happening in terms of social media, digital technologies are things like Fiverr, you know, things like where you can go on there and get a logo for five bucks. So I'm sure that's something you come across now. You know, I'm, I'm sure you charge a very good fee for your work because you know the value that it that it produces. You know, what's the difference between going with the professional branding firm and, hey, just getting a logo off of Fiverr? Where's the value? Yeah, see, we charge that? $6 for a logo, so that's totally different. No, we... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're significantly more expensive than $5. That's but, awesome. Um, I think the big difference that you get is with a $5 logo, you sort of get what you pay for. Uh, but... Uh, you know, we really lead with the strategy piece. So I think absent uh, brand strategy and some of that deeper dive research and interviews with your clients and, um, you know, that's really, I think, where the value is. I think anybody can make you a pretty thing. And if uh, I, you know, I would encourage architects who are listening to this to, to think about this similarly. It's not just about making a beautiful building or a beautiful space, but can you really solve the business problem? Can you really help somebody look at, at their space differently and help them change how they do business through your services of architecture? So it's, you know, the consulting piece of it, I think is so much greater than, than just the design of, of the building or the physical space. 
Yeah, let's talk about that sales process for a little bit. And the reason I bring that up is just because, you know, I, I'm sure it's something that you've dealt with as a designer. Architects would deal with that as well, where people come in and say, uh, you know what? I mean, I could get a draftsman. I just need a permit. You know, that's all I need. So it seems right. like sometimes when clients come in, they have a picture of what they think they need. Right. But you as a professional, right. you know that what they really need is something yeah, else. Yeah, I think the, the, two, um, the two main red flags that, that hit us are, are one, when a client comes in and they you know, they just have no idea what something should cost. Uh, and the other red flag is when their request starts with just, I just need a, you know, all I, I just need a, I have the ideas or I know the solution. I just need somebody to do it. I just need to stand over your shoulder and point. And, um, you know, regardless of what their budget is, that's, that's probably not going to be a great, <laughs> a great engagement. So that's, that's a word that scares us off pretty quickly. And well, it sounds like you've been able to, you know, going back to the content marketing piece, it sounds like your book has been a big win for you. Yeah, absolutely. We've been able to, um, you know, one of the things I always encourage our clients to do as well is, you know, if you take the time to create a big piece of content and, a, and there's not much bigger pieces of content than a book, but how do you then take that product and then find what are all the byproducts that live inside of that book? So how many blog posts could you create from that 250 page book or how many of those images or charts or graphs could you pull out and, you know, drop something on Pinterest or Instagram, or those could be accompanying images for your blog posts or how many, how many things in that were tweetable. So how many tweets are inside of that book? So really to, um, as Jason Freed from 37 Signals, now Basecamp, uh, said in his book, you know, they, they always strive to find the byproducts within their product. You know, what are not just the thing that they made, but what are all the smaller pieces that make that up that they could turn around and sell or reuse as well? And so that's something that we always, we always look at pretty closely. Great. And the book you're referencing for our listeners is Rework right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Rework by Jason yep. Fried. So, um, yeah, I definitely think architects would check that out. It's going to kind of give you a different, different viewpoint on kind of all the, maybe the value you're creating in your business that you're not capitalizing on and, and leveraging on right now. Yeah. The great thing about that book is you'll go through most of it and you'll think, oh, that's interesting. And then occasionally you'll go, wow, that's the best idea I've ever heard. And then you'll read the next page and go, that is stupid. I would never do that. I hate that idea. And, but that's, what's cool about it is it's just kind of this unfiltered opinion and it's all pretty strong stuff. So um, you'll have to weigh for yourself what things you buy into and what things you don't. But um, I think it's it's a provocative read and definitely a quick one at that. Definitely. Uh, Josh, in, in your book, what, what's some of the feedback you've been getting, uh, parts that people find really engaging? What are people liking best about uh, the message that you're sharing? So one of the ones that I just heard back from uh, most recently my friend Laura runs a new uh, podcast that's launching soon as well called Communa Queso, queso spelled like the cheese. Um, and she was talking about the chapter where I was uh, kind of ripping on mission statements. <laughs> so I think most mission statements, uh, the ones that you find, you know, framed on the wall, they all sound the same and they all don't mean anything. So the ones that say, you know, we, we strive to deliver on time quality service and, enrich people's lives, you know, who doesn't strive to do that? Everybody should strive to do those things. So, um, we certainly encourage people, if you, if you feel you need to, to write a mission statement, by all means do so, but do one that has uh, specific meaning to your team and what you're about that actually drives to the heart of your mission, not just checking off something that a corporation or, or a firm should probably, you know, probably check the box. Um, and likewise, a vision statement should be something that is truly aspirational that points, uh, uh, you know, a finger out at the left field wall, like Babe Ruth did before he went up for his famous home run. You know, he said, this is where I'm going. I'm going over there. And if your vision statement doesn't do that, if it doesn't point the, uh, paint the picture of this is where we're going, we're going over here. Who's with me. Then your vision statement is, is falling down as well. So, um, those are the two things that I always cringe a little bit when, when we walk into a firm and they say, well, we, we just redid our mission and vision statements. I'm like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> Let me take a look at that mission and vision statement and we'll, we'll see how much help that's actually going to be for us. Okay. And 
how often are they how do you take that conversation if you see that they've just done something like that in your head you're thinking okay they just spent money to do this they just spent time this is a product of their heart and soul and that's what hurts the most is knowing that they probably invested uh not only money in it but they probably put a lot of committee hours into it as well um you know for us we've got to just uh, do our own research and, and help them unpack what's right for them. Uh, if it gives us an opportunity to circle back and maybe make some tweaks to that mission statement or help them with the vision, um, I think it helps that one of the one of the tools that we strive to create for our clients is what's called a brand essence. So more than a mission statement, a brand essence is what we see as really boiling your brand down to one or two or three at most four or five words that that really capture what it is your brand is about and how it's different, how it should be perceived in the marketplace. And, and those words, that brand essence should become really the compass for where everybody is moving towards. So in my mind, that could easily replace what your mission or your vision statement, at least in the, the old, <laughs> the old version, uh, I think a brand essence does with the mission and vision never could do. Do you have any case studies that come to mind that you could share with us where that was, you know, someone, you came up with a really great mission statement or something coalesced and you felt that it was, you know, it, it did good. Yeah. I mean, um, I might be tough to bring up a specific brand essence. Uh, there are a couple of examples in the book, but, um, we've had multiple clients say to us, um, first of all, that the process help them answer questions that they didn't even know that they had. You know, they were starting to uncover things about themselves and, uh, and really learn things about their own company that they didn't realize were even inside of them. So uh, on one point, I think what we do is sort of like therapy because <laughs> we sort of encourage everybody to, to learn more about themselves in the process. But, but it's also sort of like being a talk show host because you're trying to get that story ready for prime time and get it to a place where, where it's interesting for everyone and they want to hear it. So, um, I think those, those brand essence statements are the things that our clients are able to carry with them and use that as a little bit of a litmus test to say, okay, if we're going to do this kind of thing and our brand essence says we are this, you know, how does, how does that apply or how might we do it different in the context of that? Josh, how do you think you could take these concepts of branding, of brand essence, of of forming this message, and how does that apply to the individual, right? So we're talking about businesses now, but it's almost like a fractal, right? You can also take it down to the individual level. You know, as an individual, you could have a mission statement, you could have a vision statement, you could have a brand. Yeah, absolutely. So the <clears throat> the personal brand piece of this is really important too. Um, and so much of it applies the exact same way. So, um, you know, getting inside your own head to, if you're thinking about starting your own firm or you want to, um, kind of do your own thing or, or really even just maybe you want to work at a firm forever and ever, and you want to retire there, but you want to be known as the, as the Revit guy, or you want to be known as the sustainability guy, or you want to be known as the the company culture guy, you know, how do you, how do you help build that brand for yourself on a personal level? <clears throat> In many ways, I think it's applying all of those same principles that we're talking about for the firm, just on the individual level. So thinking through, you know, what are the, what's that one or two or three words that drives everything that I do. And I think people are, uh, should be so much deeper than a firm is. So you should have so many things to work with. Uh, but at the same time, similar to the firm, there may be questions that you haven't even thought to ask yourself. So I think working with a coach or, uh, you know, somebody who specializes in helping professionals grow and learn about themselves, I think is a very similar way to, to get at some of those same things. Yeah, that's thanks for that, Josh, because I think a lot of our listeners, they might not be firm owners right now. They might work in a firm. So thanks for bringing it back to the individual, giving them some ideas about you know, how this could be applicable to them. So hopefully that's given them something to think about in terms of what's my own personal brand? You know, where do I want to be? What's my mission statement? 
Yeah, exactly. And I think um, <clears throat> the two things that also apply very closely to the individual level are content marketing and social media. So thinking about, again, whether you want to go out on your own or not, what do you want your body of work to look like in the next five or 10 years? You know, what are the types of things that you want to look back in the next five years and say, yeah, I, I did all those things. You know, you can, you can be employed somewhere else, somewhere else and still write a book or author some great white papers or do some research, um, create your own blog where you talk about a specific topic that's near and dear to your heart and really to help create, uh, those pieces of thought leadership and that, that content that's going to drive um, both the marketability of yourself personally, but also for the firm that you work for, knowing that you're one of the uh, thought leaders inside the four walls there. Excellent. So if you had to, if you had to boil down the, the essence of a bold brand, Josh, what would it be? That's a great question. Um, so I think one thing um, is absolutely clarity. So being able to say something distinctly from, uh, from your competitors is one thing, but, but true and accurate to, to who your firm is and what you're about, I think is number one. Um, and two is consistency. So being able to, um, you know, once you identify that, that essence, that your, your voice echoes that essence, that the, the words you use and the way you communicate echoes that, that you're, um, the experience on your website, your <laughs> the way you use email, your your consistency with your brand from a visual standpoint, that those things are all very consistent with with what your brand is about. So I think brands that exhibit clarity and consistency are the brands that come off as bold. Excellent. Thank you. So we, we've been speaking with Josh Miles today. He's a principal with Miles Herndon and author of the book Bold Brand. Josh, is there any, any parting words or thoughts that you'd like to leave to our, our, our listeners advice for our, our loyal fan, our, our loyal audience of architects and designers? No, I think you've got a, a great audience here and a great community and it's really cool to see what you've built. And, uh, I'm excited and hopeful that a, a year from now we'll be talking about something similar with obsessed show. And, uh, I hope your fans will check us out in the podcast realm here in the coming months. Absolutely, they will. And I highly just go pick up, go pick up Josh's book. If you're listening to this, you, you absolutely have to. I mean, I, I wouldn't be doing justice to you as my listener if I didn't tell you get out there and do this. Josh has spent a lot of time um, and effort putting together a great, great resource here. And so, I mean, he has, there's case studies in here, there's examples. And he really, like I said, he gets content marketing. So a lot of times I'm hesitant to, you know, espouse what a lot of branding people say because, well, that's a whole nother show, but I, I can fully <laughs> endorse what, what John is, uh, Josh is doing here. So Josh, thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, you bet. My pleasure. Take care. Okay. You too. Bye-bye. Have you thought about starting your own practice or are you looking to take your practice to the next level? If so, I wanted to let you know that free registration for the 2016 Architecture Business Plan Competition opens on December 1st, 2015. Start your planning process now and enter for a chance to win a grand prize of $10,000. Five finalists will be flown to Philadelphia to present their full plans to four industry-leading jurors. Travel and lodging are provided. So this is a one-of-a-kind competition. It's open to all licensed architects in the United States and Canada who are planning to start a new firm within one year or currently own a firm that is less than 10 years old. Visit archbusinessplan.com to learn more. And that's a wrap for another show about the business of architecture. To get more resources about how you, as an architect, can run a rewarding business that is both fun, flexible, and profitable, visit businessofarchitecture.com and click the Join button to claim your free account to Business of Architecture Insider. As a member, you'll have access to free tools and resources to help you get more clients, start a new firm, and much more. You'll also get access to my book, Social Media for Architects, where you'll learn how to use internet tools for fun and for profit. Until next week, this has been The Business of Architecture. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment 
except to help you conquer the world. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5, Do It Anyway.